Hey y'all, thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Katusha, and today I wanna to talk to you all about another hero, Paul Rusesa Bagina. So this video is twofold, you guys. I do wanna tell you the story of Paul Rusesa Bagina, but I also want to let you guys know about a tragedy that's ongoing today with Titi people in Africa, and I wanna discuss our responsibilities as humans of this world, the responsibility that we have to one another as exemplified by Paul Rusesa Bagina. In 1994, Paul Rusesa Bagina was a hotel manager in Kigali, Rwanda, when the genocide broke out, claiming the lives of a million people. Rusesa Bagina was half Hutu and half Tutsi, so he faced a choice. Fall in line with the mass hysteria and pick up a machete, flee Rwanda and save himself from the war, or use his talents and resources to save the lives of as many people as he could. Let's talk about the choice that he made. Tensions between the two major ethnic groups of Rwanda, the Hutu and the Tutsi, came to a boiling point in 1994 after centuries of conflict. If you haven't already seen it, I do have a video that's called Rwanda's Boiling Point, the Genocide, and it dives deeper into the history of Rwanda and the conflict between these two groups. For the purpose of this video, I'll just say that in 1994, Hutu extremists started killing Tutsis after the plane of the two Hutu presidents of Rwanda and Burundi was shut down. Armed groups formed called the Interahamwe. They were made up of Hutu military officials and the Hutu elite. They spread propaganda and they encouraged Hutu Rwandans to turn on their Tutsi neighbors, to rape them, maim them, take their property, and make them all suffer. Now, several countries happened to have a presence in Rwanda at this time because of a fear of this exact catastrophe happening, but they all just stood by. Most countries eventually just pulled their troops out. Not even any neighboring African countries stepped in to help the slaughter Tutsis. Not even one. And so we find ourselves at the home of Paul Rusesa Bagina on the morning after the killings began. He and his family awoke to horror and chaos in his neighborhood. All of his Tutsi neighbors had been massacred and his wife Tatiana was a Tutsi, so his whole family was in danger. Two dozen Tutsis that Rusesa Bagina knew had already shown up at his home when soldiers, Hutu soldiers, arrived at his door. They were part of a militia that had they were part of a militia that had taken over the diplomat hotel at which Rusesa Bagina was the hotel manager. They had been sent to fetch him to open the food stores. As he drove to the diplomat hotel with his family and all of his guests in tow, he was stopped by another group of soldiers and they handed Rusesa Bagina a gun. They ordered him to kill his Tutsi wife, his children, his family and everyone that was traveling with him. Instead, Rusesa Bagina negotiated with the genocidaires for the first time and it would not be his last. He empathized with the soldiers he acknowledged their hunger, their pain, their resentment for the Tutsi elite. He was able to convince them that killing these Tutsis would not solve their problems. He persuaded them to let him and his party make it to the diplomat hotel, and when he got there, he promised to pay them off. After accomplishing that, Rosetta Begina took his family and his guests to the Hotel de Micolin, which was nearby. It was owned by the same Belgian company that owned the diplomat where he worked, and they authorized him to act as hotel manager at the Hotel de Micolin during this national emergency. 1,000 Rwandans had already taken refuge at the Hotel de Micolin. He quickly made the paying guests pay off their balances, and he used this cash plus alcohol from the hotel bar to bribe the entire Hamway, and he was able to keep the hotel residents safe this way. So many people there looked at Rusesa Bagina as their leader, their advocate. So when the UN sent a list of people that they were going to evacuate from the hotel, with Paul Rusesa Bagina at the top of the list, the people panicked. They were sleeping 10 to 15 people in a room, but at least they were safe from the terrors that they were able to see being done to their Tutsi neighbors on the news. Some people threatened to kill themselves. What would they do without Rusesa Bagina? There's a story that I mentioned in my video about the genocide, and it talks about the fact that there were Belgian soldiers who were supposed to be protecting the school that was filled with 2,000 Tutsis that were hiding from Hutus. And at some point, they were ordered away from the school to evacuate foreign nationals. And as soon as they left, the Hutus entered and massacred all 2,000 residents. This is what these people feared. And so Paul Rusesa Bagina, he stayed, he stayed behind. And after a failed attempt to try to evacuate his family, he ended up staying at that hotel with them for almost 80 days until the Rwandan Patriotic Front was able to negotiate for the release of all the refugees in the country. And at this time, Rusesa Bagina was still thinking about others. 
he stopped and rescued some orphans that were living behind Tutsi rebel lines when he was on his way to escape to Tanzania with his family. When the genocide ended a few weeks later, on July 4th, Rusetsa Bagina himself lost four of his eight siblings. Tatiana Rusetsa Bagina lost her mom, brother, sister-in-law, and four nieces and nephews. Her father paid the Antara Hamwe just to execute him simply so that he wouldn't be tortured and maimed before they killed him. After moving a few times because of death threats, the Rusetsa Baginas now reside in San Antonio, Texas. I am highlighting this man's story today for many reasons. First and foremost, his recognition for the value of life. Paul Rusesa Bagina understood what I hope that you and I will understand today. Human beings are human beings. There are no differences in the races. Hutu and Tutsi people may have different cultures, but we must accept that we come from the same place. One does not have more of a right to exist than the other. On the contrary, if we all as human beings, particularly Black people, came together as one, united, we would be unstoppable. We would experience such an abundance of life. We would no longer need to rely on foreign aid. We would no longer have to hear about civilization and civilizing the African races. Just look at the Hutus and the Tutsis. Look at the strength of both people. Tutsis built kingdoms and dynasties in Rwanda before colonialism. Hutus led the rebellion that gained us independence in Rwanda. Imagine what heights Hutus and Tutsis could bring Rwanda, Burundi, and the Congo if Tutsis and Hutus would commit to being allies for the good of the people. I mean, look at Rwanda today. They call it the Singapore of Africa. It is beautiful because of how far they've come, because of the fact that they have forced themselves to come past this tragedy. But look at them at the height of the genocide in 1994. 10,000 people were dying daily. Rwanda in that moment was no longer a kingdom or a free and independent republic. It was hell. Blood was literally running through the streets like rivers and it was being broadcast on the news to countries that didn't care and wouldn't do a thing for a hundred days. And today, we find ourselves in a similar situation. In South Kivu and the Congo, there are more and more instances of ethnic cleansing being perpetrated on a Congolese group of Tutsis, the Banyamulenge. Local armed groups known as the Mai Mai have burned down over 200 villages. They've stolen the Banyamulenge's cattle, which represents their wealth and their livelihood, and killed hundreds of people hundreds of their own Congolese people. Now this is a fresh wave of violence, but the attacks have actually been going on for decades because the ethnic groups that compromise the Mai Mai, the Babembe, Bafuliru, and the Banyendu, they all believe that they are indigenous to the land while the Banyamulenge Tutsis are not. This partially stems from the fact that colonial Belgium never actually assigned any specific territory to the Banyamulenge people in the region. Meanwhile, the Banyamulenge people had been occupying the Malenge Mountains since before the Belgians colonized the area. Banyamulenge literally means the people of Malenge. As the Banyamulenge's numbers began to grow, however, due to the Rwandan and Burundian Tutsis fleeing war and persecution in the 1960s and the 1990s, local anti-Tutsi sentiments began to become popular. With the addition of the Hutus that were fleeing prosecution after the 1994 genocide, the Mai Mai's numbers began to grow, much greater than the numbers of the Banyamulenge Tutsi. And since then, ethnic cleansing has never truly ceased in the area. Today, as we step into 2020, the violence is at an all-time high in South Kivu. Land is being taken. Schools and hospitals are being destroyed. People are being beaten, maimed, and raped. 8,500 people were displaced in November 2019 alone. Now, what can we do? We can do something as simple as sharing videos like this. You can even just talk about what you've learned with your friends and your family. Spreading awareness is key. Right now, the only coverage that the Congo is getting in mainstream media is on Ebola. So getting awareness about this issue with the Beni Malenge will need to be a collective effort. You can also make a financial contribution by going to savemalenge.org and either buying some merch or donating. All proceeds will go towards providing food, shelter, medical needs, feminine hygiene supplies, and transportation to safety for Malenge people. These provisions are the most urgent needs but we must also hold the Congolese government accountable for not fully securing its own citizens. The Congolese government has played a very big role in creating this anti Beni Malenge sentiment. At times in the past, the government has revoked Bani Malenge citizenship of the Congo. They have supported and trained these Mai Mai groups that have perpetrated these attacks on the Bani Malenge. And to this day, they continue not to keep them safe. This cannot be. Congolese citizens, both at home and in the diaspora, 
all Africans and all black people. We must call for the Congolese government to put down this rise of ethnic violence against its own citizens, the Malenge people. This perception that any African is an enemy of another African is a lie. The hospitality, the ambition, the hard work, the love, the loyalty, the dedication that you'll find anywhere in the Congo, you will also find in the East. Those are your brothers, your cousins, your children. And I urge the private citizens of Africa and all citizens of this earth around the world to pay attention, be aware of this massacre that is happening right now. See your own people in the Bani Mulenge, in these refugees, in these people who have been killed, who have been destroyed, who have been stolen from, whose children have been taken. Show them the mercy and compassion that you would want if you were in their shoes. Take responsibility for them. Like Paul Rusesa Bagina, he took responsibility for his fellow man. And that is something that I urge us all to do today, this week, this month, this year. Be dedicated, be committed to being an advocate for somebody else. There are so many people, there are so many people in this world right now who are being massacred in mass. Reject and rebuke the hatred that is being conspired around you. Instead, take them in. Take those people in that are in need. Feed them, clothe them, keep them safe. You can make a statement in your own actions that this ethnic cleansing, this violence that exists in our continent will not continue. You can represent the true spirit of Africa, one without blindness and one without borders, one where we see the truth that we are one and we do have a responsibility to one another. That's just my little thoughts, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you actually enjoyed this video, if you learned anything from it, please be sure to share it with somebody. Spread the news, spread awareness about the Bani Bolenge. They need us. They need us, you guys. Thank you, guys.